Thank you everyone for joining us today for our overview of the 2023 ICPSR summer program. We are delighted to have you here. Today, we are going to introduce you to the summer program, our history and our parent organization, ICPSR, which if you don't know already, stands for the Inner University Consortium for Political and Social Research. We'll talk about our curriculum, uh, which broadly breaks down into two categories, our short workshops and our three week sessions. We'll discuss our prospective fees and discounts for 2023 as well as on-campus housing for in-person participants in our three-week sessions. Uh, we'll talk about our scholarships, as well as uh, opportunities to serve as a teaching assistant in the summer program next year. And then at the end, we will hold a Q&A uh, and answer your questions and uh, let you uh, tell us what we failed to cover uh, in this presentation. So let's get started. Uh, I'd like to introduce our in, uh, administrative staff, which you can see uh, are all present today. Uh, they are busy year round, believe it or not, even in the winter, uh, setting up, preparing, and getting the summer program up and running every year. Uh, first, I would like to say, uh, uh, well, introduce and say a big thank you to the summer program's uh, outgoing director, Mike Traugott. Uh, Mike stepped into the director role in uh, January of 2020, uh, and you probably had no idea what he was getting into, but thanks to his leadership, he helped to guide the program through the pandemic and uh, transition to all virtual classes that summer. And then he helped us transition to a program that was hybrid this past summer. Uh, I know that I speak on behalf of all the staff um, when I say that we are very grateful to Mike for his guidance these last three years. I know it was very challenging, but he helped us make it through it, uh, and we wish him a very uh, relaxing summer and time off uh, in 2023. We'll miss him. Uh, our new director is Rob Franzese. Uh, Rob is a professor in political science here at the University of Michigan. His research interests center on the comparative and international political economy of developed democracies and related aspects of empirical methodology. And he's been teaching in the ICPSR summer program for many years. He can tell us how many if he wants to. Um, so I will uh, mute myself and let Rob say a few words of greeting to you all. Thanks, Stephanie. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, it, uh, can you hear me? Actually, Stephanie, give me a thumbs up. Yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, hi, everybody. Uh, th thanks for coming to the webinar. I'm incredibly excited to uh, take uh, the directorship from uh, uh, Mike's in, in, uh, incredibly capable hands uh, and excited about the program that we're assembling for uh, for you uh, this coming summer. Um, yeah, I've been teaching in um, IC, I've been teaching in the ICPSR summer program for uh, 14 years, and um, I think that's the number. Uh, and I've uh, learned a lot over that time, and, I, and I've uh, seen a lot of participants get an amazing amount uh, from the program. Uh, we're excited this year uh, to um, uh, boost and, and uh, press the, um, the in-person experience again, which has been foundational for so many people um, through the uh, availability of, uh, of dorm housing uh, right here on campus. It's really quite excellent housing. Uh, for an affordable uh, price, so we're hopeful to um, to really invigorate that as we continue the expanded access that uh, remote courses offer. And I'll let that uh, I'll let that go for now. All right, thanks, Rob. All right, y'all see my screen again. Uh, the rest of the staff here uh, include Scott Campbell, our communications coordinator, who spoke at the beginning, uh, Corey Steiner, our administrative assistant, and then Sandy Zalmut, who is our technical assistant. Uh, they're great people to work with and very eager to help you, so don't feel shy about reaching out if you have questions or need assistance with anything. All right, uh, so the ICPSR summer program goes back to 1963. Uh, at the time, there was an increasing interest and need for quantitative analysis among social scientists. Uh, there was a lack of faculty uh, back then teaching social methodology at academic institutions here in the US. Uh, and there were also a lot of self-taught practitioners of research who wanted to gain more formal training. 
1962, uh, a political scientist named Warren Miller worked to create ICPSR in order to share data from the ANES, or the American National Election Study, which still runs to this day. Uh, a year later, in 1963, uh, he helped found uh, the summer program, and he launched it with the aim of training social scientists in uh, both element elementary research methods and survey research, as well as more advanced analytic techniques. Uh, the photo that you see on this slide is the first ICPSR summer program in 1963. And you can see Warren Miller in the bottom left corner, uh, looking sharp, wearing the white shirt and the black bow tie down there. A lot of bow ties back then. Uh, both the summer program and ICPSR have expanded over the last six decades. Uh, today, ICPSR is an international consortium uh, with more than 800 members. These include universities, uh, colleges, uh, research organizations, and even parts of the government. Uh, ICPSR maintains the world's largest social science data archive. We have more than 250,000 files of research. Uh, we also have uh, 21 specialized collections of data uh, in topics and subjects, including education, aging, criminal justice, substance abuse, terrorism, and other fields. ICPSR's mission is to provide leadership and training in data access and curation, as well as methods uh, for analysis and research uh, for the community. So ICPSR is a unit within the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan, and our offices are housed here in uh, sunny Ann Arbor. Um, I'm kidding, it's very cold and dreary outside right now, but it's very nice in the summer. So I'd like to talk to you about what distinguishes the summer program. Uh, and it starts with the breadth of the courses that we offer. Our comprehensive curriculum includes more than 80 courses every summer. It is a lot. Um, our curriculum is designed to meet the needs of students, faculty, uh, postdocs, scholars, researchers of all different skill levels and backgrounds. Uh, our curriculum starts at the beginning uh, with a course in introductory statistics in our three week sessions. From there, participants can move on to regression analysis, MLE or categorical analysis. Uh, we also offer introductory to advanced courses in a variety of statistical and quantitative methods, including Bayes, multi-level models and network analysis, as well as courses in formal modeling. We also offer courses in machine learning, text analysis, data science, and we've even moved into qualitative uh, research methods and mixed methods as well. So we are no longer bound by quantitative methods. And then finally, we offer um, in-person and online training opportunities, kind of depending on your need. So our courses feature dynamic training from leading experts. Uh, the instruction that you're going to get in our courses is in-depth, um, applied, and it's going to be responsive to your specific research needs and goals. And many of our courses, you are welcome to bring and use your own data uh, and the uh, exercises that you'll be doing in the courses. As for our instructors, our faculty include more than 100 researchers and educators um, from universities and institutions across the US and beyond. Uh, these folks are at the top of their game, uh, both substantively and pedagogically. Uh, they are conducting and publishing research in uh, top tier, really respected academ uh, academic journals from all different disciplines. And not only uh, are they experts in their fields, but they're top notch instructors who are skillful at teaching you, the participant, um, how to understand and employ the specific methods in your own research. Our instructors really take the time to explain theories behind the methods and then demonstrate through re uh, real world applications. Uh, our instructors invite questions in class and afterwards. Uh, the result is a very supportive and encouraging learning environment that features a lot of one-on-one -on -one guidance and individual feedback. We really pride ourselves on that. So uh, in regards to collaborative learning at the summer program, uh, we believe that learning is a collaborative process between you and the instructor, but also between you and the other participants. Uh, our courses feature opportunities for group learning and making connections as well. Uh, we train uh, about a thousand participants every summer and they represent a wide range of institutions, disciplines and backgrounds. In our courses, there are going to be opportunities to meet and connect with people that are in your field. Uh, a few years ago, I was speaking with a participant who had attended the summer program and talking about networking opportunities. 
And this participant said that at the summer program, you have the chance to see how researchers in your field at other institutions around the country are approaching similar research questions to your own. In addition to that, there's also a lot of opportunities for inter, uh, interdisciplinary uh, connections and insights as well. Uh, many of our former participants have followed up with us either via email or conferences uh, to let us know that at the summer program, they not only had a great time, but they found uh, a research collaborator or co-author or mentor. And then finally, um, I'll mention our uh, Blaylock lecture series. Uh, throughout the summer months, we offer um, a series of free presentations by respected researchers on uh, both top to, uh, substantive topics as well as methodological issues. Uh, these in the past have included uh, data literacy, responsible data management, uh, racial and gender inequality, and the use of big data in public health research. These virtual lectures are free and open to the public, uh, regardless of whether or not you de uh, decide to take a course with us. Um, and they also give you a chance when you attend to ask questions of the presenter. If you're interested, you can view past Blaylock lectures on the Summer Program YouTube page. You can find that link from our website. I encourage you to check them out. They're really great. So let's return to our curriculum and take a deeper dive into the courses we offer, beginning with the short workshops. Um, our curriculum is quite broad. Um, every year from May through August, we offer more than 40 short workshops. Our short workshops provide uh, rigorous uh, training in a specific uh, technique, and typical courses will include uh, group-based trajectory modeling, interactive visualization, dash, uh, dashboards, and apps with R and Shiny, uh, introduction to network analysis, uh, machine learning, uh, item response theory, causal inference, and many more. And we're still putting together our short workshop schedule, so um, we don't have the final uh, course listing yet, but many of those return year after year. Our short workshops can range in length from several days to two weeks. Uh, the daily meeting schedule will vary depending on the format or mode of delivery. If the workshop is held in person, it may meet for six to eight hours a day daily. If the workshop is online or virtual, um, then it may only meet for four to five hours daily in order to prevent Zoom fatigue. Um, we plan to hold in-person workshops here in Ann Arbor, and are also looking into offering um, them in other locations around the U.S., and we'll announce that probably in January. All right, water break. Stephanie, can I jump in there and note that... Yes. Um, uh, but for the short workshops and uh, also to a certain extent for the, uh, the three week sessions, uh, the number of contact hours, uh, teaching hours of a course really comes in a, in two different uh, forms, sort of a full course is 40 uh, more or less contact hours, about the same as a, a semester course uh, in an academic year and, uh, and a sort of half course is about 20 contact hours. So those short uh, courses could meet for one or two weeks or three days, uh, and they could come in uh, 20 hour or 40 hour uh, varieties over those time spans. Yes, great. Thank you, Rob, for pointing that out. And everyone remember that because that'll um, come up later when we talk about registration and registration fees. Um, all of our short workshops, um, whether they're in-person, hybrid, or virtual only, will feature extended access to the lecture recordings and workshop materials uh, for a period of time after the workshop ends. We're still determining that length of time for 2023. Um, let's talk about who attends the short workshops. Our participants uh, are mostly advanced graduate students, postdocs, faculty, and other researchers. Uh, enrollment is typically capped at 20 to 25 people per course or workshop. And then we also offer something that we call a sponsored short workshop. Uh, a sponsored short workshop uh, focuses, focuses on and explores a substantive topic or specific data set, such as the population assessment of tobacco and health study, the panel study of income dynamics, or the monitoring the future study. Uh, workshops that are sponsored are typically offered by an archive or a project here at ICPSR. They are typically free to attend for admitted applicants. Uh, these workshops include a competitive application and review process. 
Um, and we will post that list of sponsored short workshops along with all of our regular short workshops in our schedule uh, in January or early February before registration opens. And then finally, um, and most excitingly, I wanna draw your attention to a special week that will feature uh, several in-person short workshops uh, here in Ann Arbor uh, from Monday, July 10th through Friday, July 14th. We are going to have a, a special week of workshops. We're calling it our intercession week um, because this week falls in between our first and second three week sessions. Um, so if you're interested, um, and a really uh, great slate of workshops and also possibly attending our three-week sessions, um, we would encourage you to check out the schedule that we're going to post in our intercession. All right, three-week sessions. Uh, so who attends our three-week sessions? I kind of like to give you an idea of what the, uh, the audience is like, and it's broad, um, basically. Most of our three-week session participants are grad students, including masters and PhDs. Um, they tell us that they attend for a variety of reasons. Um, they want to beef up on their statistics skills before they enter a grad program. Um, they want to take courses that aren't uh, currently offered at their home institution or might be limited. Um, they want to take a course that's going to help them with their dissertation, or they just want to learn uh, a semester's worth of material in three to six weeks. Uh, our other participants in the three-week sessions include advanced undergraduate students, as well as postdocs, faculty and other researchers who may have been out of school for several years, but are seeking to relearn or really broadly expand their uh, methodological uh, skill set. Uh, our three-week session participants come from more than 40 different countries and represent more than 30 different disciplines. Uh, and in each session, we have about 200 to 300 participants. Uh, so you may be wondering, um, should I attend in person or online? Because we offer our three-week session courses uh, in a hybrid format. And I'm going to say there are advantages to each format, and the choice is, of uh, course, going to depend on your circumstances. Uh, online participation might be well suited to those with families, work, or other obligations that are going to prevent them from traveling to Ann Arbor for three to seven weeks, although we do have uh, participants bring their whole families to Ann Arbor, um, and there's a lot of stuff to do here in the summer too, so don't let that be a barrier if you have young kids. Um, our online participants will still have access to all of the lecture recordings and other course materials, uh, both during the course and after it ends. Uh, and then online participants can also meet with their instructors and TAs on a daily basis in office hours via Zoom. Uh, online participants will also have a chance to get to know their fellow attendees through our, uh, through our Slack channel and then other virtual meeting groups, TBA. Uh, but there are also a lot of opportunities and benefits for in-person participants. Uh, when you attend in person, you really have the opportunity to focus on your courses and shut out distractions um, much better than you could if you were at home. By coming to Ann Arbor, you're really able to prioritize your learning in a way that virtual participants tell us that they just really struggle to do. Uh, we offer a lot of social events for in-person participants, including uh, weekly coffee and donuts, um, a, tidy, a tidy Tuesday R networking lunch, um, and then we have picnics. And then there are a lot of other informal study groups and social plans that participants um, organize on their own. Uh, countless participants have told us that um, when they attended in person, our three-week sessions are um, kind of like a fun nerd camp or a fun statistics camp in which they get to spend day after day getting to know other data nerds, um, and they have a good time here. Um, many of our participants come here uh, and end up meeting instructors who become their mentors or other participants who become their lifelong friends or research collaborators. Um, so that goes back to the, the community that we create here. It's just, it's really unique and unparalleled. We understand, though, that it takes time and money to come to Ann Arbor for several, week, uh, several weeks during the summer. So stay tuned in this presentation and in the coming weeks as we announce incentives and discounts uh, for in-person participants. So let's, I skipped a slide there. So let's talk about our registration fees and discounts for the 2023 program. 
uh, registration for all of our courses, um, both the short workshops and the three-week sessions, will open in early February of 2023. Uh, we're going to have two separate registration portal portals. There will be one for the short workshops and then one for the three-week sessions. So if you want to attend both a session and a short workshop, you'll need to register in both of those portals. As for registration deadlines, uh, the deadline to register for a three-week session will be at least one week prior to the start date of that session. The deadline to register for a short workshop will be at least 72 hours prior to the start date of the workshop. So most of our short workshops start on a Monday, uh, and that deadline is typically on the Friday before. Uh, we do offer incentives and reasons to register early and not wait until the last minute. Uh, we offer an early payment discount on our registration fees for our three-week sessions. Uh, this date is May 1st. And then also many of our short works, uh, short workshops, as I said earlier, have enrollment caps at 20 to 25 people. Uh, so if you wait too long to register, uh, there's a chance that um, one of these courses will fill and there may not be a seat available for you. Um, moving on to talk about fees. Um, as I mentioned earlier, ICPSR is a consortium um, with more than 800 members. Uh, these members include universities, foundations, government institutions, nonprofits, and more. Uh, if you are a current student, faculty, staff, researcher, or other person affiliated uh, with an ICPSR member institution, say Ohio State University, uh, Temple University and the University of Michigan, uh, you qualify for the discounted registration uh, registration fee for participants from ICPSR member institutions. You see those two columns there. One is for members and one is for non-members. Um, as Rob mentioned earlier, our short workshops um, kind of broadly break into those that have 20 contact hours and those that have 40 contact hours. Um, and the fee that we will charge depends on um, which one of those uh, number of contact hours that the workshop has. Um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but we charge a flat registration fee for our three-week session, which is going to enable you to take as many courses within that session as you wish. Um, I want to note that the registration fees that you see here in this chart are projected for 2023. Um, we will post final pricing in February when registration opens. As for discounts, we do offer a 15% discount for returning summer program participants. This means that if you attended the summer program, be it a session or a short workshop in a previous year, um, you get this discount if you return in 2023. And then we also uh, plan to offer a 15% discount off your total registration fees and you register in multiple short workshops uh, or a short workshop and a three-week session. All right, let's talk about on-campus housing if you're interested in attending our three-week sessions. One way that we're trying to make it easier to attend in person is by offering this uh, option for on-campus housing. Uh, we will offer on-campus housing for both of our three-week sessions, both the first session and the second session. Uh, the housing is going to be in East uh, in the East Quad dormitory, most likely, which is located on the University of Michigan's uh, central campus and within walking distance of all of our three-week session courses. Uh, the dorm rooms are doubles, meaning that they can accommodate two people. Uh, each person will have their own bed, dresser, desk, and chair. Uh, there's a community bathroom on each floor, and bathrooms are separated by gender, but there are also gender-neutral restrooms as well. Uh, the expected rate for a single bed in a double dorm room is going to be about $40 a night. So um, if you plan to stay 20 nights for a single session, the total approximate cost would be about $800. Um, please note that this fee is not included in our registration fee for the three-week session. It's separate. Um, and there's also a small additional charge for linens as well. Um, if you choose not to have a private room to yourself, um, if you want to have a roommate, um, your roommate would be another member of the ICPSR summer program, and we should have more information about whether you can pick your roommate, say, if you're attending with a student or somebody that you know from your home institution or organization. Um, the dorm rooms do not have their own kitchens, so um, meal plans will be available for purchase. Um, these will be for the campus dining halls, and the approximate cost is terrific. It's about $75 a week, 
which includes three meals a day, Monday through Friday, and then two, wheel, uh, two meals a day on Saturday and Sunday. Um, that's just unbeatable here. All right, scholarships. I know everybody's eager to hear about these. Uh, we offer more than $150,000 in student scholarships every year. Our goal with this is to remove financial barriers to participation in the summer program and increase access to statistical methods training for students of all different backgrounds. So what do the scholarships cover? Um, our scholarships provide registration fee waivers to our three-week sessions. Um, two of our scholarships, the diversity and the Miller scholarships also come with a stipend that you can use to support the cost of travel, housing, other living expenses um, while you're attending a session. And one of our scholarships, the Owen, um, can only be used as a registration fee waiver to a short workshop. So that's the only one that's open to the short workshops. In regards to eligibility criteria, our scholarships are targeted towards students, including undergrad, master's and PhD students in specific disciplines, including sociology, political science, education, public policy, quantitative history, and a couple of other disciplines as well. Our few of, a few of our scholarships are open to pre-tenure scholars and early career academics. Uh, and then we also offer diversity scholarships for graduate students from underrepresented groups who are about to enter or are currently enrolled at a university within the US. With the exception of that last scholarship, the diversity scholarship, all of the other scholarships are going to be open to international students. Um, and each scholarship has its own set of eligibility criteria. So you'll wanna make sure that you read the description for each scholarship uh, listed on our website. Um, you may apply for more than one scholarship. You're welcome to apply for any and all scholarships for which you're eligible. Um, but you'll need to submit a separate application form and materials for each scholarship. Um, a lot of people want to know if they have to get unique uh, letters, uh, letters of recommendation for each scholarship that they apply for. No, you don't have to. Um, you'll just need to submit them each time for the scholarship that you're applying for. Uh, in order to apply for a scholarship, you have to fill out the form through our scholarship application manager, uh, which is set to open next Monday, December 5th. And then you need to submit all of the required application materials. In most instance, instances, these materials include a cover letter um, that explains your research interests and goals, your previous training and statistics, uh, which three-week courses you want to take, and then how you kind of hope to apply what you learned to your work. Um, you also typically need two letters of recommendation and then a CV as well. As I said, we'll start taking applications through our online portal next Monday, December 5th at noon Eastern. Um, it will be, our, our scholarship application portal will be open throughout the uh, winter holidays, including Christmas and New Year's. Um, but please note that the summer program staff will be taking a break um, during that time and will not be answering emails. So if you have any issues or problems um, from December 26th through January 2nd, there's not gonna be anybody on hand to answer your questions. But once we get back in the new year, we are happy to help if you have had any issues or have questions about scholarships. Um, all scholarship application materials, including the letters of recommendation are going to be due on February 1st, 2023. And um, I don't think it's too lofty to say that I hope that we can make announcements uh, on decisions um, in March, 2023. Uh, and finally, I want to say about our scholarships that they can be career changing. Um, they can really help take you places um, that you wouldn't have gone otherwise. And our goal with these is really to help students who wouldn't other, uh, otherwise be able to attend uh, because of financial limitations. So if this is you um, or if you know somebody uh, in these circumstances, I would really encourage you to apply or encourage others to apply as well. Um, the summer program offers a lot of teaching assistant positions for graduate students. Our TA positions provide invaluable pedagogical experience for grad students to take into uh, future teacher positions at colleges or universities. Uh, this is a really terrific opportunity, I think, to work alongside a summer program instructor and to meet and connect with a diverse international an interdiscipl uh, interdisciplinary constituency of summer program participants. 
Um, some of our TAs go on and uh, turn out to be summer program instructors as well. Um, we have more than 50 TA openings every summer. That tends to be kind of the number that we hire. Uh, TAs are uh, assigned to assist with um, one course per three-week session. Um, we offer um, approximately 20 different courses in each three-week session, um, so you would be assigned to one. Uh, TAs will be expected to work in Ann Arbor. They're not going to be any virtual or remote TA positions that we anticipate at this time. Um, TAs will be expected to work uh, probably up to about 40 hours a week during the session that their workshop is scheduled, um, with the possibility for some hours um, in the week prior to the start of the session if you need to help the instructor with kind of preparatory work. And the compensation um, will be approximately $34 an hour. It's tied to the rate that the University of Michigan pays its GSI uh, graduate student instructors. So we don't have that final number yet, but I expect it'll be a little bit higher than 34. The typical responsibilities for our TAs include assisting the instructors with preparation and presentation of class materials and lectures, meeting with the workshop instructors, attending the daily lectures for the course and answering participant questions either in class, in person or via Zoom, holding office hours, holding lab sessions or other supplemental learning uh, sessions as needed, and then also evaluating work and grading course assignments. Uh, we're still finalizing our qualifications for 2023. I expect they're going to resemble our 2022 qualifications, which included that you be currently enrolled in a PhD program, that you have um, a master's degree or equivalent um, or an equivalent combination of experience and education. You're going to need um, experience with quantitative research skills in the social sciences or a, another related field, um, experience with statistical computing software, um, great communication skills, both oral and written in the English language, a good interpersonal skills, um, past experience as a TA and a stats course, and then uh, a knowledge and command of the skills and material relevant to the courses that you're seeking to assist with. Um, regarding required application materials, this is also TBA, but I expect that it's going to include a cover letter, a CV, letters of recommendation, and past course evals. Uh, we'll announce our positions and post them to the University of Michigan Careers website uh, in January 2023. All right, that's all I have. Scott, have we had any questions come in? Yes, we have. Um, we've been answering a bunch while the presentation was going. Um, so we're we're fine repeating questions uh, if you still have some. Um, but we have one. Uh, I'll just start at the top here. Is there an option for auditing a course while fully participating in one or two other courses? that it's attending lectures, but not necessarily submitting assignments for a final grade. I'll take that one. Um, yeah, so in principle, it's definitely possible during the sessions to do that. Um, our our three-week uh, program is uh, a little bit new to us, um, or quite a bit new, it's new this year. Um, and uh, there'll be time to physically um, and synchronously follow a cor uh, two courses. And uh, in addition to two courses, uh, some uh, um, uh, practical workshops like the introduction to R or something like that uh, as well go, go along. So there would be only two that you could uh, be there in person or synchronously, um, but you could um, uh, follow others asynchronously um, and you can always choose to uh, participate fully and do assignments uh, or uh, to audit in either case. And uh, one other thing I guess to say on that is that uh, we do uh, intend, we'll have the recordings available um, for a good extended time uh, after the workshop, like so at least a month after. Uh, so there, there will be some time uh, to, um, uh, to follow an, a, an additional course that you didn't have time in a day to follow uh, in the time of the session itself. Thank you. Um, we're getting some questions about TA stuff. I'm just going to kind of lump them together uh, and we'll do sort of, I guess, quick as you can answer to them so we can, uh, there's, I don't know, there's five or six. Um, the first is, can participants in the summer program become teaching assistants? 
I think that one might be. Um, can whoever ask this, could you clarify? Do you mean the summer that you are a participant? Can you be a teaching assistant that same summer? Um, because we kind of have a, a backwards version of that where uh, TAs are allowed to take one workshop during the summer. Um, but I don't know some more details on that, please. Um, we have one about our recent PhD graduates eligible to apply for TA positions. That's something that we'll still be determining. So we'll post that in the in the job description. Um, is it possible for PhDs from even from universities from other countries to apply for a TA position? In the past, we have hired international TAs. Um, I will note that sometimes there can be difficulties with visas, um, but we are willing to work through those. Um, so yes, it will be open to international applicants. Can you TA for a course remotely? At this time, we're hoping to have all of our TAs in person. Um. Let's see, there's a question about what are TA duties? How can we apply that? That information we'll have uh, when the post goes up. Um, I don't know if you want to get just a quick overview of it or if we can just wait for the post to go up, Stephanie. What were they asking responsibilities? Yeah, TA duties, just in general, I guess. Yeah, that was something I mentioned. Um, so the TAs will meet with the instructors, um, help with some course prep. They will attend the daily lectures. Um, the courses are going to meet for three hours a day, so they'll need to be present at every day's lecture, Monday through Friday. Um, they will need to assist with answering questions in class and afterwards, holding office hours for a couple hours a day, Monday through Friday, holding uh, labs or other supplemental learning uh, sessions, and then uh, grading. Um, and then I think oh, this is almost the end of the TA questions. Uh, this is the, the person earlier that I asked for more details from. If they're participating in the summer program, can they become a TA at the same time? You can't be a participant at the same time that you're a TA. Um, say you wanted to attend one session as a participant and then you were hired to teach in the other session, that's possible. And some people have done it, but you can't have the dual role, dual role, roles within a session where you're both a participant and a TA. It's just too time consuming. Um, being a TA is a, a full-time job on, for the session that you're hired for. So that needs to be your focus. Um, then we have a question. I'm a faculty at another institution. Could I be a TA? At this time, we're, I think we're limiting this to current PhD students. Although if you are interested in teaching in the summer program, um, we're always looking for proposals, right, right Rob? Um, you can reach out via email and uh, send in uh, either a proposal for teaching a course or expressing your interest to us. Uh, just like I said, send that in via email um, and we'd be happy to kind of talk with you further about it. Including co-teaching if you uh, and someone else had some things in mind. Um, <clears throat> so a question about scholarships here. What are the main criteria for evaluating applicants? Would it make an application stronger if I'm already highly skilled in quantitative method? If I have a clear research proposal, will that increase my likelihood of getting a scholarship? You know, we, we award scholarships to people kind of all throughout. Um, there are educational career, um, including advanced undergrads who, you know, are years away from you and maybe thinking about working on a dissertation. Um, you need to have strong letters of recommendation, people who can speak to your skills and your potential. Um, in your cover letter, you really need to make an argument for why attending the summer program would be beneficial to you and the work that you're hoping to do. Um, take a good look at the course descriptions and syllabi for the courses that you would like to take. Um, in your uh, cover letter to us, let us know um, how those courses are going to directly contribute to work or research that you want to do either now or in the future. And I think um, that will help you kind of make the best argument that will stand out to the people that are evaluating um, the applications. Do you want to add anything, Rob? No, I think that, that nails it. Yep. Um, 
do scholarships cover both three week sessions or do you have to select one or the other? I can take that since some of my already unmuted if you want to get a drink, Stephanie. Um, uh, they can cover whichever session you want or they can cover both. Um, it's really up to you. Uh, you know, what your summer is looking like, what your research goals and uh, study goals are like. Um, you can pick the first session, the second session, or both sessions for your scholarship. Um, let's see, uh, that is related. Um, who do you recommend we ask for our recommendation letters for scholarships? And also, are they first come, first serve the scholarships? Uh, some of the scholarships have um, kind of specific requirements as to who you would need to ask. Otherwise, it's just kind of generally a faculty member. I would encourage you to pick somebody that's familiar with you and your work or research. Um, like I said, that can speak highly to it. Um, but there's typically no specific requirements on who the person is. I think the diversity scholarship um, requires you to have a letter re of recommendation from your graduate program director. And then what was the other scholarship question? Uh, are scholarships first come, first serve? Uh, no. So all of the applications will come in and accumulate over the next two months. And then when our uh, application portal closes on February 1st, only after that date will we begin looking at all of the applications together. So um, and we'll make decisions all together. It's not first come, first served. Um, let's see, could I be in person for half of the session and remote for the rest? I, I believe so. I think many people did that this past summer, um, maybe depending on obligations that they had elsewhere. So, yes. But we'd love to have you here the whole session, of course. Yeah, this, to, uh, to elaborate on that, um, there was a related question in the uh, in the Q&A about um, taking part of a, of a course or a workshop. Um, and, and certainly that's that's doable, uh, certainly in principle. Uh, if you're thinking about sort of grabbing a week from one workshop or grabbing three or four sessions from one workshop and moving into another, one course into another, that's in principle possible, but it can be very difficult to uh, to make the uh, timing work uh, rightly for you to, to execute the plan uh, really effectively, given where the two uh, courses may happen to be on any particular day. I don't know if the question was going in that direction. Um, but yes, because uh, uh, the recordings are, uh, the courses are offered in person live, uh, there'll be some uh, participants, hopefully as many uh, as possible, because there's a huge benefit to being together with others uh, experiencing this training program at the same time. Anyway, I've said that a, a couple times now. Um, so then there's the in-person live that will be live remote accessible uh, through Zoom, for instance. And um, and then it's also recorded for asynchronous access uh, for folks remote asynchronously or um, for folks who took it in person, for example, and wanted to access the remote recordings later, uh, the recordings later. Um, and so the ability is there always uh, for you to take part of it live and part of it in person, if uh, uh, part of it uh, remotely or um, asynchronously, as may need to be the case. Um, let's see. We're getting through a lot of them. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. You can um, keep sending them in. Uh, like I said at the start, if we run out of time, um, I'm going to get a report of all the questions that were asked, and I'll send them uh, in an email the answers to those questions, uh, along with the recording and slides. Um, so no worries if we don't get to everything. Um, we have a question here. Will there be a separate webinar available in the future for scholarship application questions? Hmm, we hadn't planned one. Um, Send in your questions now, or via email. Uh, you can send in your questions now. You can also, uh, you know, at the uh, uh, this ICPSR summer program uh, email address. Should you have questions of, uh, of of that nature or other questions about the program, you can always send it to them, and uh, through uh, some of our team will get back to you, for sure. Uh, is there a way I can take the program and at the same time do my summer internship at a different school because I'm required to do so in my higher ed program? 
Um, it, I think it kind of really depends on um, which part of the program you're doing. If you're doing a short workshop or a, a three week session, I will say that all of them are t intensive. Um, so if you're taking one or two courses uh, in a three week session and then also attending lectures, that's going to be a full day of stuff. Um, you will be able to watch recordings in the evenings or at a time that suits you. And um, all of those course recordings um, will be available after the session ends, um, but you'll kind of lose the benefit of attending live, getting to go to office hours, asking questions in class. Um, so um, if at all possible, I, I don't encourage people to try to double up on two really taxing things, such as this internship, it sounds like, and then also the summer program, just because this is so exhaustive and we do want you to get as much out of it as you can. So that's my recommendation, but it'll have, have to be your choice. Um, let's see, we've got uh, for three week sessions, I can take this one. It says we have access to unlimited lectures per session. Are lectures live or asynchronous recordings? Um, they are delivered live and recorded. So yes to both. Um, Live, you know, if you're attending in person, you have access to recordings as well, so you can go back and watch something for review. Um, and then obviously people who are asynchronous uh, have access to those recordings. So uh, every course, every lecture in the three week sessions is recorded uh, fully hybrid for uh, in person people or online people. Um, let's see. Um, trying to figure out some of these I know we're going to have to work on later um, just because I know that we might not know the answers to everything right away um, so how about uh, I'm a PhD student expected to graduate this summer can I still become a TA uh, those are still rules or uh, or guidelines or structure still being determined but in past yes that's been that's been a possible in your final terminal year of your PhD program, you could uh, be a, a, a GSI, as we call them at Michigan, a graduate student instructor. This person's wondering, can admission be deferred for scholarships or program admission? Uh, so the program is going to be open year after year to you. You don't have to worry about kind of admission requirements. Um, if you get accepted for a scholarship, um, but you're not able to accept it this year, unfortunately, we can't defer it to the next year. You would need to reapply next year and kind of enter that competitive pool again. At least that's the way it's been historically. So unless you plan to change that, Rob. Um. Do most people take more than one course in a session? Yes. Yes, most people take two. So the way it's going to work, uh, there'll be a, a, what we call a lecture uh, in the morning, first thing in the morning, so like an intro to our kind, uh, perhaps. Uh, and then there will be a, a three hours minus changing time uh, uh, course one. Uh, block and then there'll be a lunch. Uh, there might be something that you want to do during the lunch as well. And then there'll be a course two block, uh, three hours minus changing time. Uh, and then there might be a evening uh, lecture uh, that you might want to go to as well. So um, and that gets back to the earlier note about um, uh, it's quite intensive. So for three weeks every day, uh, you'll be uh, you would ordinarily be taking both of those courses plus one or more of those lectures that cap it on either end. And plus, you could uh, audit, as was mentioned earlier, uh, an additional course, basically backpacking it to plan to take it asynchronously later, since it's probably humanly impossible to add a third course into that same three weeks. Uh, we have a question here about what kind of housing options families may have used in the past. I think for this next summer, um, our recommended housing option uh, for families um, might be one potential place close to campus, but we're still kind of investigating um, possibilities for that. So I'm not going to announce it yet. Um, I'm just not sure of space requirements. Um, I don't have any good recommendations at this point. Um, 
Scott, can you think of any? Yeah, I mean, to put a little more flesh, not much, onto that. Um, what people have done in the past is uh, found what they can find um, in the Ann Arbor area. Now that it's a, it's a, a, a large, you know, it's a good market because it's a large university, so there are lots of places. Uh, but Ann Arbor is also quite pricey, and so, uh, as Stephanie said, we're working uh, to enhance what we can offer in that direction, um, particularly for families. Uh, for uh, for folks who are not families attend, uh, attending in person, um, the uh, the doubles in the dormitory right close to the class. There's uh, linen service. They're modern uh, dormitories, which uh, um, you know uh, certainly much better than what I understood dormitories to mean <laughs> back in my day. Uh, they're they're really quite nice, actually, uh, as these things go. Uh, and for a reasonable price uh, with meal plan options and also all of Ann Arbor right at your fingertips. So it's really, uh, I, and then you'd be right in the densely interacting summer program of you and everyone else who's attending uh, Method Summer Camp, uh, as we call it. Um, so uh, it could be a, a really terrific experience. And for families, we're, we're working on increasing the options, but for right now, it's uh, what we can find in Ann Arbor. Um, we've got one here about uh, does having work experience in the program as a TA help uh, on the research or job market? I'll take that one also. Yes, resoundingly. Uh, the um, uh, I've taught methods in the program for 14 years and taught methods uh, as a faculty member for 27 plus or minus years. Um, and uh, being a methods GSI is an enormous advantage in social science job markets uh, and uh, and also uh, increasingly these days in job markets outside of academia uh, as well. Uh, so, yes, it's a tremendously valuable uh, work experience, in my opinion. And I don't think that even uh, is just a reflection of my biases. I think that's factual. I can add to that and say I was speaking with uh, one of our former TAs, actually now a, a current instructor, and he said that um, after he finished his PhD and went on the job market and was before hiring committees, um, it happened at least once, maybe more than once, that people that were on the committee reviewing him and interviewing him were like, oh, I see PSR. I went to that. And so it's just kind of a great way to connect and bond. I could add one more <clears throat> quick comment, which is, it's typical to have to uh, submit teaching evaluations as part of the job application process. And we do course evaluations for every instructor and TA. So uh, you would conceivably have uh, positive uh, teaching evaluations that could also be part of your application process. Um, we have a question about. Uh, is there any vague anticipation of the living costs for the three-week sessions? I would say email us. We have um, a kind of rough budget proposal that we um, need to update for 2023, but it'll include the cost about on-campus housing. And if you were to go into the open market, kind of typical cost for maybe finding a one-bedroom or a studio, um, as well as um, food or other expenses. So yeah, send us an email and we can send you that um, budget proposal for attending a three-week session. Off the top of my head, I just, I can't say. Um, we have a question about uh, what does a competitive scholarship application look like? That's a good question. I could, I could I could say something having participated in the review of the applications in the past. Um, be, besides the letters of recommendation, there's obviously a very important relevance background criterion. So we look at the cover letter to see how the applicant describes uh, themselves in terms of their background and experience in relation to the criteria set up for the scholarship. So um, if, if 
if I were constructing a letter, a cover letter as an applicant, uh, I would pay attention to the uh, criteria in the description and then talk about my background and training and my research experience and uh, my future research interests in terms of the criterion for the specific uh, scholarship. Well, everybody, we did it. We got through all the questions. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for all those questions. Um, like I said, a couple of them, um, we'll get back to you. Uh, oh, wait, oh, we have one, one more came in. Uh, will we have access to this meeting afterward? Yes, you will. Um, I'll send the recording and slides. Actually, this is a really great segue to the end of the webinar. Um, I'm going to send the recording and slides uh, out in an email tomorrow or Friday. Um, uh, as well as the uh, answers to any questions that we didn't get to, although, like I said, I think we got to just about everything. Um, you can contact us. Uh, that email is in the chat. Um, that uh, is sumprog, S U M P R O G, at icpsr.umich.edu. Um, goes to all of us. Uh, we are pretty quick at answering emails, not to toot our own horn, but we're, you know, we're pretty good at it. Um, so I want to thank everyone for coming today. Um, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention. Um, that's all from me. I don't know if Stephanie or Rob or Mike, you want to have a sign off, but thank you, everyone. Come see us in Ann Arbor this summer. Looking forward to it. <laughs>